Thank you, thank you very much for having me, and thank you for coming. Uh, and thanks for that introduction. So I gave a, a talk here last year when I focused on the history of the United Kingdom, and so now I'm going to be talking about more general work that I've done as a result of the other populations. And in particular, um, We've been using a particular type of DNA to try to infer history, so I'm going to walk through how this process works, how we extract this information from the DNA, what we're focusing on what's known as autosomal DNA. So if you were here last year, these first few slides are going to be very familiar, but um, I'll walk through them again. So there's different types of genetic data that can be used to study the history of individuals, and if you've been following these genetic ancestry testing companies, and genetic ancestry in general, you will probably be familiar with these two types of analysis, which are the most prominently used in the field for a number of years, largely because it's the most easy to extract and analyze. And it's still being used today, there's a talk later today that deals with this type of data. Uh, so for example, the Y chromosome, and the interesting feature of that is the fact that it's passed along from father to son, so you can use the trace maternal lineages. And then on the other end, uh, you've got mitochondrial DNA or mtDNA, which is passed along maternal lineages, so it's passed along from mother to offspring. I'm going to be talking about a different type of DNA known as autosomal. DNA, which is much of the rest of your genome. And so in contrast to these two types of DNA, they're inherited from both parents. So it's averaged across both parents. And we each have 22 autosomes. So within each autosome, you have one chromosome that you got from mom and one from dad. And one big advantage about looking at autosomal DNA is that they contain many thousands of times more genetic information per individual than either Y chromosome or mitochondrial DNA. This has to do with the way that autosomal DNA is inherited, as I'll talk about in the next slides, but they're potentially much more powerful for informing you about your genetic ancestry. So Y chromosome mitochondrial DNA is passed along from one ancestor down the lines, while your autosomal DNA is inherited from many different ancestors, as we'll talk about briefly. But a drawback is, uh, and one reason why this kind of DNA is still very useful, is that not, autosomal DNA cannot easily tell you about sex bias intermixing. So if you had two different groups that intermixed at some time in the past, and one of the groups contributed an excessive number of males, and the other one contributed a large number of females. That's difficult to tell from autosomal DNA because of uh, the fact that we inherit DNA from both of our parents with sex average. That's more readily uh, easy to tell by studying Y chromosome mitochondrial DNA patterns. You can do some of these things with autosomal DNA by, for example, comparing it to X chromosomes, for which females have two and males have one. But for the focus of this talk, I'm going to be talking about sex average uh, mixing. Okay, so what does your DNA look like, your autosomal DNA? So across your autosomes, you inherit a sequence of 3 billion A, G, Cs, and Ts from each parent. So this is a cartoon example of one small part of that region. So within each region, such as this one, you have one chromosome that you get from mom and one from dad down here. So you've got two chromosomes representing this region. And again, this is going to be a sequence of A, G, Cs, and Ts. Let's say there's a couple other additional individuals that we've sampled uh, this region for as well. So we've got three individuals here. Now, as you can see in this cartoon, uh, most of your DNA is going to be identical amongst individuals. In fact, about 99.9% .9 of your DNA will be the same like compared to two of you. And so we're not interested in those parts that are the same because we're interested in comparing differences amongst people. And so in particular, we want to focus on areas where in our sample, our chromosomes can be different values. So for example, this third location here and the second to last location here, and in particular, we're going to focus on uh, DNA locations where sampled chromosomes can mean one of two different things. So for example, at this third position, uh, a chromosome can either be a G or a T and nothing else can't be C or A. And at this position, it can either be a T or an A and nothing else can't be a C or a G. And these are known as uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, for those of you that follow the field. Uh, we can refer to them as genetic markers or genetic variants. And I'm going to ignore the rest of the DNA because, again, it's not informative. We only care about these sites where we do. And these differences occur about every 300 to 1,000 base pairs in, in typical modern human collections. Okay, so furthermore, uh, I don't particularly care about at each location what type you are, whether you're an H, C, or T. I only care whether you're one type or the other. And so I can arbitrarily encode these as I like. So I'm going to, instead of calling these G and T, I'm just going to represent them with black and white circles. So if you're the G, you're the black circle, the T, the white circle. And here I'm going to do the same thing. I don't care about the fact that it's the T or the A. Here I might call the T the black circle and the A, the white circle. So at each location, the data then is whether you're of one type or another type. And I'm just going to represent these with black, black and white circles. OK, so the final bit of biology you need to understand for this presentation is how autosomal DNA is inherited. So say this is a particular region of your mother's genome. So in this genome, she's going to have one chromosome that she got from her mother, in blue here, i.e. your grandmother. 
and what chromosome that she got from her father, i.e. your grandfather. And then she's going to pass along a chromosome to you, and your father's going to pass along another chromosome. That's how you end up getting two again. But the chromosome that your mother passes along might not simply just be the blue or the red, but it's often a mixture of the two like this. This is because of a process known as recombination that occurs during meiosis. You don't really need to know anything about recombination for this talk, other than it causes this sort of pattern to occur. So in this cartoon, I've made a recombination happen just to the left of center. And the net effect is that this left segment of DNA is inherited from the grandfather, and this right segment is inherited from the grandmother. And so there's two main consequences of this type of, of this recombination event, the way DNA is inherited, that I want you to know about in this talk. So over the generations, pieces of DNA are passed along in blocks. So here you've got a block from your grandfather, and you're another block from your grandmother. And who you're related to changes along the genome. So here you're related to your grandfather. Here you're related to your grandmother. And if I were to throw down my genetic markers in this region, that would reflect this inheritance pattern. So these first two genetic markers, these black and white circles, match what your grandfather had. And these last three match what your grandmother had, because that's who you inherited from. Okay, so taking a step back, a more broader picture. So I'll throw your dad in here. As well, we could watch that DNA's pass through the generation. So here's you at the bottom. You've got two chromosomes representing this particular region of your autosomal DNA. And then here's your mom and your dad. They also both have two chromosomes representing this region. And here are your four grandparents. And I've assigned each of your grandparents a unique color for their DNA. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow this DNA through in time to you. And so just as I showed you in the last slide, your mom gets one chromosome from her dad, from her mom, and one from her dad. So the previous slide, I had this represented with blue and red. Now I've got it with blue and green. It's the same idea. And similarly, your dad's going to get one chromosome from each of your grandparents on that side. And then your mom's going to pass along a chromosome to you. It's going to be a mixture of the DNA from these two, your two grandparents. And similarly, your dad's going to pass along a chromosome. It's a mixture of your grandparents on that side. And in fact, across your autosomes, the entirety of your autosomes, you're expected to get 25% of your DNA from each of your four grandparents. But I can go back further. Instead of relating you to your grandparents, I can look at your great-grandparents. So I'm not going to throw them all up here, but I can represent your grandparents on the DNA they've inherited from your great-grandparents, i.e. their parents. So there's eight different colors here, each one representing DNA from your eight different grandparents. I can follow that forward in time again, so that gets passed along to the generations. And you might look something like this, and now overall you're expected to get an eighth of your genome from each of your eight great-grandparents. There's no reason I should stop there. I can go back as many generations as I want. So say if I go back 10 generations, you're expected to have over 1,000 different ancestors. And they're all fighting to contribute to your DNA, and so maybe you look something like this if I pass this to the generations. And so really, across your genome, you're only expected to get less than 1,000 from any one of them. So some of them may not contribute anything to this region or anything to your genome at all. But a key point is that I can take any slice of time in the past and I can color you according to the DNA that you inherited from ancestors at that particular time in the past. Okay, so here's you colored by your ancestors 10 generations back. So this is the DNA you've inherited from ancestors 10 generations ago. Let's say I've got a couple of other individuals unrelated to you colored by the DNA of the ancestors they've inherited DNA from 10 generations back as well. So when I say unrelated in this sense, I mean that these people aren't first or second cousins as far as we know. They're, they're unrelated in that sense. So this is the kind of DNA that I deal with. We took a sample of uh, DNA from us in this room. As far as I know, not related to any of you. So that would be a sample of unrelated individuals. If any of you came here with a family member, we'd just randomly throw one of you out of the auditorium and we'd have an unrelated sample. But when I say unrelated, the reason this is in quotes is because none of us are actually unrelated. If we, if we go back far enough in time, we'll share ancestors. So for example, if, if you've got over a thousand ancestors ten generations back, it's not inconceivable that some of those ancestors would have passed down DNA via some other family tree down to other individuals in this room. That's what I've highlighted here, which again, this is still a cartoon, but these are areas where these individuals have inherited DNA from their same ancestor ten generations back. So for example, this little green bit of DNA can be found was inherited in both individual one and individual three. And this yellow segment uh, right next to it was inherited in individual one and individual two. So we'll have these things that have been inherited in us from, from different ancestors at different periods of time. And in fact, if we go back far enough in time, any two individuals are going to be related. So if I compare my genome to you, at some point in each location of my genome, we're going to share an ancestor. It's just a question of how far back in time we have to go until we share that ancestor. So it could be, if I look at one second of my genome, I share an ancestor with you, say, 10 generations back, and you 20, and you 15. 
maybe out of everybody in the whole auditorium, tends the lowest number, so I'm more related to you than anybody else in the room at that particular spot in my genome. But at the spot next to it, I might be related to somebody else because of this pattern of inheritance, the fact that we are related to different people in different areas. But in any particular spot in my genome, I can identify who I'm most closely related to amongst the sample. So here, what I can do is I can say this is me down here, this is my genome, and now I've compared my DNA to seven of you, to use the DNA from seven of you, and now these colors refer to which one of you I'm most closely related to in each location of my genome. So for this red segment, it could be that I'm related to you 10 generations back, and this yellow one is 12 generations back, and time doesn't matter. What matters is that I'm more closely related to this person than anybody else in my sample at that location. And so how do, I, how do we actually do this? How do we make this inference? Of course, we don't actually observe the colors, but what we do observe are these DNA variants that I told you about at the beginning, so these black and white circles. So what I can do is I can take my DNA and say that's here now, H4, compare it to three of you, and identify which of you seems to have the most matching DNA patterns, best matches my DNA patterns. So here's one particular match I might infer by comparing my DNA of H4 to these three chromosomes here. And the interpretation is that these first two genetic markers or variants are most closely related to H1 out of these three. And these last three are most closely related to H2 out of these three. And I might believe that because of these matching allele patterns. I most closely match H1 here in terms of these DNA patterns. And I most closely match H2 in terms of DNA patterns of these three. And so this is what I do. I just take DNA from a sample of individuals. I compare you to another set of individuals that I've sampled and identify who do you match in each location of your genome. That tells me that you're more closely related to that person, that part of the genome, than anybody else in the sample. And again, a common theme is that who you're related to changes along the genome because of this idea that you've inherited ancestry from other places, from different ancestors. Okay, so going back to this picture here, so here I've come with this person uh, according to who they're most closely related to. So now you can start to make some interesting inferences about this person's history. So say, for example, that I know that these first four individuals are all Native Americans. And these last three are all Europeans. Well, I can assign them their own unique colors, blue and red. And then I can color code this according to who they matched up to. So I can pass these colors forward. And now suddenly this individual at the bottom looks as if he's got a mixture of DNA from Native Americans and Europeans. And this is the kind of thing that might happen if, say, there was a Native American group and a European group. They met up at some point in time. They exchanged DNA. They intermixed. And then this person descends from that mixed population. So that's the kind of signal that we're looking for. We can take DNA from groups and compare it, compare it to a bunch of other worldwide groups, see if they match to different parts of the world, and if they do, we can try to determine which parts those are, and if that seems to reflect some known history. And we can do a bit better than that, and that we can even, so more generally this would be the case, I've, I've talked about the example of Native Americans and Europeans, but more generally, this might happen if, say, there was a local population living in a region, and a group of migrants came into that region and intermixed with them. That might lead to these types of signals. If we could do even better, we could figure out exactly what these two groups mix by looking at the sizes of these blue and red segments in you today. And I'll illustrate that in the next slide. But the key take-home point is that you can use DNA to detect whether migrants have intermixed in different geographic regions of the globe. You can look at different groups, identify whether they have DNA that seems to come from different locations, and we can figure out when that mixture seemed to have happened. How do we figure out when it happened? Well, it turns out that the blue and red segment sizes are expected to be exponentially distributed, so this follows from some mathematical arguments. So we expect our blue and red segment sizes to follow these type of distributions, exponentially decaying with rate equal to how long ago the two groups mixed, how many generations ago they mixed. So for example, if the red and blue groups mixed uh, 50 generations ago, there's not going to be very many large segments, there's going to be a lot of small segments, relative to if the two groups mixed five generations ago, then there's a lot of big segments. This is because if I, remember when I composed your DNA as mixtures of your grandparents, you had lots of big segments that related to your grandparents. And when I composed you in terms of your ancestors ten generations back, they were much smaller. So you can use the segment sizes as a clock to count back how many generations ago the groups mixed. Okay, so here's a real data example. So this reason I was talking about Europeans and Native Americans. So one of the groups that we put down are the Maya. They're located here in uh, South America. And in them, we, compared, we took their DNA and we compared it to some 95 different worldwide groups across the globe. We found that the majority of their DNA matched to other Native American groups in blue here. So the size of the box in this, in this picture reflects uh, the proportion of DNA that matched to those groups. And that's not surprising because these Native American groups share the same 
general ancestral history in that their ancestors would have crossed the Bering Strait about 15,000 years ago before settling into these regions. But in the Maya, we also see some matching to groups uh, that look most like modern day Europe. And, this is, and if we look at the size of these segments, so we look at the size of the segments that come from the orange group, the blue groups, the blue groups in Colombia are an example, and the size of the segments are in black here. And if I look at, say, the size of the segments that match to Spain, they're in black here as well, and they decay exponentially. I can fit an exponential distribution to it in green. And it turns out that the best fitting rate, the rate of decay of these exponentials is about the same, uh, suggests that this mixture happened about 300, 400 years ago. And if you know your uh, U.S. history, that nicely fits what we know about conquistadors in this region coming into this area and intermixing with the local populations. So this is likely a genetic signal of that mixing of that. And also, we also see this link to Africa, and that also makes historical sense. When the conquistadors came over, they kick-started the transatlantic slave trade, which would have led to African migrants going into this region as well. And so, just to point out that uh, we have a web page available uh, at mixturemath.paintbychromosomes.com where we have the results for each of these 95 groups that we've looked at, so if you happen to have a favorite population, you can click on them and it'll tell you whether we see evidence of these mixing events, and so who mixed and when that mixture happened. And these plots look basically like this, but for the rest of this talk, I'm going to simplify these plots and just show you the best matching overall group that we think contributed to it's the group that matches the most. So in this particular example in Spain, uh, modern-day Spanish individuals, we infer that they contributed 19% of the DNA to modern-day Mayans. And that this mixture happened in, as far as we can tell, 16, 70 or sometime in this range. Which seems to fit quite well with known history. But a question you might be wanting to ask is whether our methods work. So that last particular example does fit known history. Uh, we know that there hasn't been mixed, there has been uh, Spaniards that came into that part of the world and made intermixed with the local population, and it had to happen uh, post 1492, post Columbus. And so our results seem reasonable, but we can also simulate mixture and see how well our model can recapitulate these results. So I'm going to show you the results from a couple simulations that we looked at. So, for example, we could take a DNA from a group from Central South America called the Ruhui and mix them with another group from Africa, Nigeria, called the Yoruba, and we simulated a mixture where 80% of the DNA came from this red group. 20% of the yellow, and it makes 30 generations ago. So that led to simulated individuals that had pieces of DNA from these groups that look roughly like this. And then what we can do is I can take these simulated individuals, forget that I know who made them, and see if I can reconstruct exactly which groups mix and when that mixture happened, using all of these different populations of whites, and comparing the DNA of this group to all of these different white dot populations. So that's what we did here. So here's the truth. Again, this group mixed with this one. You're allowed to describe this event using any of these groups in white. And here's our model's inference. So our model basically tells us that we think it was a mixture between a group that predominantly looks like it comes from this region, which nicely matches the truth, and that that group mixed with a group that lives in Africa. We can't quite tell where in Africa, because it turns out that there's three groups in our data set represented with black diamonds here that are equally related to the Yoruba. So our model thinks it could be any three of them. But it gets the proportions exactly right. It says that 80% comes from uh, the red group and 20% from the yellow, the African group. And furthermore, if I look at the size of the yellow and red segments, like this black line here, if I fit an exponential distribution, it tells me that they, uh, the best fitting rate of that exponential is 30, which is exactly what those two groups mix. So we're able to determine, just by looking at DNA, precisely which groups mix in this, uh, the history of these individuals, and when that mixture happened. It's a very high accuracy. That's a relatively easy problem. Here's a harder problem. So. That was mixing between different continental groups, and so the problem's easier if you can tell apart the DNA, and it's easy to tell apart the DNA of continental groups because they're somewhat diverged. Uh, a harder problem is to look at mixing within Europe. So we, we mixed individuals from southern Italy, so each of these pie charts here, they're very hard to see, but it represents a sampling location. So individuals were sampled from these different uh, locations and circles here. Uh, and we took individuals that were sampled from southern Italy and mixed them with individuals that were sampled from northern Germany. We mixed them at these proportions, and we simulated the mixture to occur 40 generations ago. And then we asked, okay, so if we ignore who mixed, can we recapitulate exactly which groups mixed using all of these possible groups to explain who mixed? And here's our inference on the right. So we do exactly recognize that it was precisely these two groups that mixed. We get the proportions pretty much exactly right. And furthermore, if we look at the, uh, the segment sizes of these red and blue segments, it's a bit noisier than what you saw before. That's because the problem's harder. DNA of these two groups is quite similar, so it's harder to tease apart. But 
But nonetheless, we did our exponential distribution in green. We did an estimated data of 40 generations, which is exactly what we simulated it as. So it works quite well in a variety of circumstances. Uh, it turns out the DNA is extremely powerful for picking up these types of signals. All right, so now I'll show you some results from real data. So we applied our method to each one of these populations, one at a time. And again, what we did is we took each one, compared it to all the others, and said, is there any evidence that this group is mixed with any of these other groups? And if so, when did that mixture happen? And the answer is, pretty much all of them, or very, very many of them, do have evidence of these mixture events. So the ones in red are one where we can clearly characterize mixture of these groups. The ones in gray are where we are pretty sure, we're very confident the mixture happened. We just can't quite figure out who with this data set. The ones in white are areas where we didn't see anything in these samples. But actually, as I'll demonstrate later, we think that's due to small sample sizes in some cases. Uh, a lot of these groups really had about 20 individuals. And if we had a higher number of samples, we'd be able to see mixing in those groups as well. And so really, most, if not all, of human populations have evidence of these type of events, mixture occurring in the last 4,000 or so years. And I'll show you some examples. So some of these, you can try to start to relate these things to historical empires. So one that uh, is quite famous is the Mongol Empire. Uh, during this period, that was initiated by Genghis Khan and then is carried on by his successors. We found in several groups that we looked, like that looked at that spanned the former Mongol Empire across Central Asia, they had DNA that matches the present-day Mongolians and dates nicely to this time period. So an example of the Uyghur, located here, about 50% of their DNA we matched the modern-day Mongolians. And we dated those contributions looking at the size of segments, and we got a date that fit nicely to the period of the Mongol Empire. You see a similar signal in Uzbekistani, uh, Hazara down here, and even as far west as modern-day Turkey, we see DNA that traces back to present-day Mongols and dates to a similar time period. Now, again, this all, for, this all spans the former Mongol Empire, so that's a consistent explanation for where this signal is coming from. However, a couple months ago, I gave this talk in front of a group of archaeologists from Turkey, and they pointed out that, uh, you'll see that this date seems to be a bit earlier than these other ones, and they suggested that it's probably not the Mongols, but rather the Turks, who also came from this part of the world, came a little bit earlier and also swept across this region, in fact, gave Turkey its name. So it seems probably much more likely that it is the Turks that made this signal. And so it was, it was a bit embarrassing. They kind of very sternly rebuked me and told me that I was completely wrong. But nonetheless, this, I, I thought that it provides a nice illustration of what you can do with DNA and how it complements other sort of uh, sources of information. So I plug this DNA into this machine and tell me that there was this DNA contribution of 8% that traces to this area. It happened at this time, but it's up to you to say, figure out what that means. So I don't know. It doesn't tell me that that means that it was the Mongols or any other particular group. You've got to use other archaeological or linguistic records to try to figure out what might this signal be referring to. So I think if DNA is a, is a strong complement to these other types of information, and an entirely independent source can help resolve controversies amongst uh, different fields. So another example I'd like to point out, uh, there's one group, Halash, that reside in this region that's uh, clearly part of the former Mongol Empire, where we really do believe it's Mongol contribution, yet we don't detect any DNA that links to the Mongolians. We do detect a mixing in this, in this group. Uh, it's, it's an interesting group. It's one of the uh, most isolated groups in our data set. It lives in a mountainous region, and so it's fairly hard to access this region, so possibly the Mongols missed it as they paraded across Asia. But nonetheless, they weren't entirely mixed, uh, missed throughout history. We do detect mixing in them. Interestingly, it's one of the oldest signals in our data set. It's older than 200 BC, as far as I think we can tell. And it's from a source that looks most like groups in present-day Northwest Europe, such as Germany Austrians. Now the Kalash, some members of the Kalash community believe in oral tradition that they are direct descendants of the armies of Alexander the Great. And this particular date and this source perhaps uh, is consistent at least with that idea. There could be other explanations, there could be other groups that were around at this particular time. But this gives you an example of where DNA evidence can be used to uh, shed light on oral traditions and how likely or not they are. So that's one possible explanation of why this happens. And indeed, people in the class community, some of them do have blue eyes. They've been studied for a number of years for that reason. And some other interesting signals we see in our data, there's lots of DNA matching to Africa. So in all of these uh, populations in circles, although the matching is often to different parts of Africa. So in all these groups here, spanning the Mediterranean and parts of the Red Sea, we see matching to groups that were sampled in Western Africa, these regions in purple. While in these areas in the Persian Gulf and Arabian Sea, we also see matching to Africa. It's a small amount in all these cases, about 5 to 10%. Uh, but this, in this case, it matches to East Africa. Now, it turns out that these 
different uh, matching in these different areas is consistent with different routes that were known to occur during the Arab slave trade, where these areas uh, provided slaves to these regions and East Africa provided slaves to these regions. That's a plausible explanation for why these different sources exist. But a few other interesting examples. So looking at Eastern Europe, we detect uh, DNA contributions from groups again far away in East Asia. This time, clearly not the Mongols, but older. So, for example, in Lithuanians, we detect a contribution that dates to 634 or so. We see a similar signal in Belarusians, so tiny amounts of DNA, 2 to 4 percent. Also, in the Polish, Hungarians, Romanians, and Bulgarians. And so, again, this is more recent in every case uh, than the Mongols. We believe it has to do with migration from the Asian steppes. So, Asian steppe invaders who came from this region in the years, so you know, Abex and Huns and Maguars and Turks as well coming out in the first millennium. And interestingly, in these individuals, that's not the only group that we detect mixing with these, with these Eastern European groups at the same time. We also see mixture from another source that here I'll represent with Poland. So, for example, Lithuania seems to have DNA that matches to Poland in addition to East Asia. If I look at the segment sizes, it tells me that it happened at about the same time as the East Asians came in. And this, we also see it in Belarusians. And this is consistent with the expansion of Slavic-speaking peoples across this region, which happened around the same time, perhaps because they were running away to the south to escape the Asian But Possibly for this reason, in Greece today, we see a link to Poland that dates to the same time period. So in the Greeks, we don't see any matching to East Asia, but we do see matching to Eastern Europe that dates to this time period, which again could be related to the expansion of Slavic-speaking peoples. So in some groups, you see complicated mix, uh, signals where multiple groups are mixing at about the same time. But again, they seem to historically make some sense. And you see mixture going back the other way as well. So from the west to the east, for example, in the Tu and the Han of China, uh, we see mixture from uh, groups that look like Greeks and Turks, uh, modern-day Greeks and Turks, that date to the second millennia or so. We don't know what the signal might refer to. So this gives you an example of where DNA can be used to unearth things that you didn't really know anything about. Uh, but this was a prominent path of the Silk Road, so it could be reflecting romance among Silk Road travelers. And so overall, if I go back to my map and I look at the connections of different migrations from different regions uh, across the globe, we get something like this. And so you can see that there's been a ton of movement in the last 4,000 or so years in these different groups. So humans spread off into different regions of the globe, but they didn't stay put. They clearly have been coming back out again and intermixing in the last 4,000 or so years. So what about these areas where we don't see anything? For example, I'll focus on the UK, where we are today, where we have data from four groups. We didn't detect any ethnics from these groups. But as I mentioned at the beginning, we think this is because we just didn't have a big enough sample size in this study. So we only had about five to 20 individuals for each of these groups in this particular study. So what we did is we collected a ton of more data from these regions. So this is a study that I talked about last year. At, uh, if you get more, if you have to see it, so I'll briefly go the results here again. So we collected about 2,000 individuals from across the United Kingdom, so each dots an individual placed on the map here. And what I would have thought uh, prior to doing this study at least is that the UK was probably fairly genetically homogeneous. And if you did believe that, uh, you'd be wrong. They are, they are somewhat homogeneous, but you can actually detect strong regional differences. Uh, what we did is we took these individuals and we clustered them based on just looking at their DNA. So we identified who shares lots of matching DNA patterns, clustered them based on their DNA patterns. And so that's what this map is showing. These colors here represent clusters of genetically similar individuals who look genetically distinct from the other clusters or colors on this map. Okay, so for example, we can see that uh, we can tell apart different islands in Orkney just by looking at people's DNA. We can tell apart North and South Wales and even North and South Pembrokeshire in South Wales. We can tell whether you came from Devon versus Cornwall just based on looking at your DNA in a way that kind of nicely falls along modern county lines. And so this is kind of a unique data set. What I didn't mention is that uh, each of these individuals, we were sampled such that all four of their grandparents had to be born within 80 kilometers of one another. So we were trying to get people that hadn't moved very much, but nonetheless, I was quite struck by how clear these genetic signals were. And so one thing that we wanted to do then was learn about why these differences might exist. So part of it might have to do with the fact that some people migrate to different regions and then just don't migrate out again. They, they intermix preferentially with people from that region. So isolation leads to genetic differences. And some of it might be due to different migrations into the UK over the centuries. And so that's what we set out to explore next in this study. We took the DNA of these clusters and compared it to DNA from groups in continental Europe in these black circles here. 
to identify the different parts of the UK matched genetically to different parts of Europe, and does this reflect the, the ancestry of the known migration history into the UK? And we found that indeed they do. So here I've got pie charts. Each pie chart represents the proportion of DNA matching to these different parts of continental Europe. And so you see lots of gray. That represents the majority of matching everywhere in the UK, which is in France, modern-day people from France. But also in Southeast England, uh, most prominently in Southeast England, there's a sizable red component. That represents matching to uh, modern-day people from Denmark and northern Germany. And that's precisely the part of the world where Anglo-Saxons came from in the 4th and 5th centuries, and they settled in large numbers into this part of the UK. And so we dated that contribution. We do believe that is what's causing this, this signal here. Meanwhile, as you go north, the red disappears largely and gets replaced by green. That represents matching two modern-day Norwegian groups. It's at its highest, the green is highest in uh, Orkney individuals, and that's consistent with its own history. So following the Norse Viking migrations of the 8th and 9th centuries, Norway annexed Orkney for about 500 years to the 1450s, so we believe it's the genetic legacy of those migrations. And so you do see these differences across the UK because of these different migrations in the different regions. And so we can update our map to show that we do detect signals in this group, and that suggests that as we get more samples from some of these regions where we don't see anything, we will actually enter these mixing processes. Really, it's, it's possibly that all human groups have signatures of these type of mixture events. Okay, so some conclusions. Hopefully I've convinced you that uh, DNA is an incredibly powerful tool in for ancestral history. And as I mentioned, it can be used as a complement to other sources of information, so independent to archaeology and linguistics. It can be used to uh, confirm or deny existing hypotheses or create new hypotheses. Autosomal DNA in particular is what I look at. It carries a lot of information, uh, tons more than Y or MC DNA. Uh, and the reason for this is because unrelated individuals inherit blocks of DNA from different ancestors along the genome. So you've got several different ancestors along your genome. That's an independent piece of information that gives you lots of power to learn about these events. And we have a lot of DNA to work with in the autosomes, approximately 3 million base pairs. The results I've shown you here, we only used about 450 to 500,000 genetic markers, but now there are data sets that are coming forward that have millions to tens of millions of genetic markers per individual. And in an application of worldwide data, I've shown you that nearly all groups show evidence of past migration, so we can link these to kind of known historical empires, or sometimes we don't quite know what was going on, sometimes they resolve controversies when we weren't sure whether it was one way or the other. And in rare areas where we didn't see anything, I've shown you that larger sample sizes enable you detect these events more clearly. And so future work is to apply these methods to much bigger data sets. Instead of thousands of individuals, as I consider here, you consider tens of thousands of individuals, and these are forthcoming data sets like Genomics England, and millions of genetic markers. And also, excitingly, people are now starting to look at DNA from ancient human remains. This is really where this field is kind of moving quite rapidly. If I want to learn about the Colossus history, for example, uh, I'm relying on, I'm comparing their genome to modern day people. But modern day people may not well represent Alexander the Great's army. I might need to dig up bones from Alexander the Great army and see if really that's the kind of genetic matches that I'm seeing. And people are starting to do that more and more now. Okay, so that's all I have. Just a few acknowledgments. I'd like to thank some particular people on the methods uh, Simon Myers at Oxford, Dan Belouche at Bath, and Daniel Lawson at Bristol. Several other people involved in collecting the samples and interpreting and just involved in this research in general. I'm funded by the Wealth and Trust and Royal Society, which so references if you want further information. And again, if you want to play around with uh, looking at the results that we get for different populations, 95 worldwide groups, you can go to this webpage, click on each of them, and have a look if you have a favorite population. And, uh, that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks very, very much, Gareth. That was a fabulous presentation and really stimulating. Um, I've got several questions, actually. Uh, the people of the British Islands Project was initially analyzed as about 2,500 people, even though there's samples from about 8,000. Will there be a re bigger analysis using all 8,000 people? Uh, so I'm, I'm not involved in that project anymore, so I've moved on from there, so I'm not sure about it. I know that they are looking at additional samples. So I suspect, yes, there will be a bigger study. So the analysis that we looked at was uh, there we really reduced the data set by trying to find individuals that had all four grandparents, one of the mothers, one of the so that was kind of a proof of principle. But now, yes, uh, people are looking at the other individuals. And one thing that I have been involved in is uh, it's taking individuals we know whose grandparents come from different places and seeing if we can read really stuff precisely which places they came from on that genetic map that I showed you. And we have had success with that. So we're able to identify whether people seem to be mixtures of these different clusters as well.
Will we, as the kind of general public, be able to do that? In other words, could we download our data from uh, Family Tree DNA and then upload it up to your website to actually get a readout of comparing our autosomal DNA with the same DNA database that we have? To that, uh, not yet. That is more coming. Uh, definitely in Boston States. We are, I am working on something like that. So yes, that will be able to happen. You can, a lot of these data sets that I described today are publicly available, uh, so you can download them themselves and play around with the programs are also available to do this, so that, that might be a lot of work, but it's better off waiting until we've got it up and running. Um, I think the implication for us is that we could actually then compare our data with databases to get a regional breakdown, not just a country by country breakdown of where our DNA came from, but a regional breakdown in terms of North or South or North Wales, South Wales, Devon, Cornwall. That could be really, really helpful when we actually come to comparing our DNA with other people's DNA. I would be able to say, well, do you have anybody in, do, do you have anybody in Cornwall? Because I've got a bit in Cornwall uh, DNA, um, about 10% of my DNA is in Cornwall. And that way you can actually narrow down to where the common ancestor might be. Um, any as long as you're from the UK. As long as you're in the UK. Questions? De Debbie has a question. Practice. What we do is when we, we take their